I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of the Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. Welcome to our conference, the Dodd-Frank Act, Post-COVID-19, and the Future of Financial Regulation. This conference is sponsored by the Federalist Society's Financial Services and E-Commerce Practice Groups, and largely organized by Mr. Andrew Ullman. Later today, we'll have two top-tier groups of panelists to comment and reflect on Dodd-Frank, which was passed just over 10 years ago. Our first panel will be largely a retrospective, while the second panel will be more forward-looking. But first, to start off this morning, we'll give a special welcome to our keynote speaker, who we'll meet momentarily. First, a couple notes on housekeeping before I introduce our moderator. If you'd like to ask a question at the appropriate time, submit them through the Q&A function on AirMeet on the top of your screen, top right of your screen. If you see a question you're interested in from another participant, you can upvote that question and indicate to our moderator that it's a special question. Please do not use the chat tab to ask questions. Use the Q&A tab instead. We'll also have an opportunity for live questions at the end of our speaker's remarks, time permitting. You can request the floor to ask a live question by pressing the raise hand button and the moderator may call on you. Please make all questions actual questions, not statements, particularly given the time constraints we're operating under today. And following this segment, we'll have an opportunity for our participants to network with one another using AirMeet's lounge feature. At the end of this segment, we'll have a 20 minute break and there will be an alert saying, join the lounge. To join, click on the alert link and join an empty table just by finding an empty seat at a table. You can also join the lounge at any time during the session by clicking lounge at the top of your screen. You'll need to turn on your camera and your mic after you move to the lounge, and I hope to see you there. Let me now introduce our moderator, Andrew Ullman, the driving force behind today's conference and a member of our financial services and e-commerce practice group executive committee. Andrew Ullman is a partner at Mayor Brown here in Washington, D.C. He previously served as the Deputy Assistant to the President for Economic Policy and Deputy Director of the U.S. National Economic Council. A particular note for today's event, Andrew previously served as the Chief Counsel and Deputy Staff Director for the U.S. Banking Committee in the Senate under former Senate Banking Committee Chair and current Senate Appropriations Ranking Member, Richard Shelby. During his more than seven years at the Banking Committee, Mr. Ullman helped craft a wide range of financial services legislation, and he played a significant role in the deliberations on the Dodd-Frank Act itself. Andrew Ullman. Thank you, Dean, and welcome again, and thank you for joining us. The purpose of today's conference is to discuss the future of financial regulation. Twice in little more than a decade, the United States has experienced financial crises that have resulted in unemployment and financial distress for millions of Americans. These crises have also caused some to lose faith in American free enterprise and question whether our constitutional system is capable of constructing a financial regulatory structure that can prevent such crises. Others have even called for radical reforms. Prior to the 2008 financial crisis, it's safe to say that financial regulation was generally view, viewed as a more specialized technical area of the law. The last decade has demonstrated that financial regulation is in fact critical to our republic's stability and economic future. Indeed, financial regulation raises fundamental questions about our constitutional republic and the nature of self-government, including what is the right balance between regulation and free enterprise? Are independent agencies consistent with the framers vision set forth in the constitution? How can financial regulation avoid being politicized or is that even a worthy goal? What should be the scope of due process rights for regulated entities? And what are the proper roles of Congress, the president, and the courts in formulating and implementing financial regulation? Today, we hope to discuss these and other important questions. While there are a few easy answers, we have assembled a great lineup of current and former policymakers and distinguished legal practitioners with diverse viewpoints who can provide insights on the current state of financial regulation and more policy reforms are needed. And of course, uh, we hope to have a little fun in the process. Let us now turn to our keynote speaker. Yelena McWilliams is the 21st chair of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, where she is responsible for supervising more than 5,000 banks and savings associations, overseeing the Federal Deposit Insurance Program, and resolving failed banks and thrift. 
She is also a member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, which put her on the front lines of responding to the COVID-19 economic shock and the ensuing economic downturn. Prior to assuming her position at the FDIC, she was the chief legal officer of Fifth Third Bank and previously was chief counsel at the Senate Banking Committee. She has also has an, an amazing American story that uh, makes her a truly unique FDIC chair, but I will let her tell that tale. So with that, please welcome Chair McWilliams. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Dean, for the opportunity to join you today. As a bank regulator, I appreciate the timeliness of today's, today's discussion on the Dodd-Frank Act post-COVID-19 and the future of financial regulation. Our financial system was under incredible pressure. As the pandemic spread around the world, governments shut down business activity, workers stayed home, and hospitals and health workers became stretched beyond capacity. You will hear later from experts, some of whom are my friends, who were intimately involved with the negotiating and drafting of Dodd-Frank. I will leave it to them to debate the merits of that law in the aftermath of the first all-encompassing test of our financial and regulatory institutions since the 2008 crisis. I will discuss how the lessons learned from 2008 shaped our regulatory response to the pandemic and how the financial institutions we supervise became a conduit to national recovery. But before I get into that discussion, I realize that I may need to introduce myself to this audience beyond the title of FDIC chairman, as my background has profoundly shaped my view of the United States. I like to say that I was born on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain in the former Yugoslavia to a family of great character and humble means. Neither of my parents went to high school. As an impoverished teenager, my father fought in World War II as millions of civilians were slaughtered across Eastern Europe. As the post-war recovery took shape, educating girls was not a priority and men were needed to guard the borders, not perform calculus. Education was not even an option for my parents. Still years later, these two uneducated, humble people instilled in their daughter a belief that education was the only path forward. As I grew up, I became increasingly convinced that my destination was in the United States. From our modest surroundings in the Balkans, the United States looked like a brilliant jewel, a beacon of hope, a land of opportunity, a shining city on a hill. It was a land where someone who worked hard and developed skills could achieve pretty much anything. At least that is what American TV shows like Dynasty and Dallas led me to believe. All I wanted was an opportunity. My parents had to borrow money to give me that opportunity. I spent my 18th birthday on a plane en route to the United States with $500 in my pocket and a dream that I could make it someday. Within six months of my arrival, the country of my birth ceased to exist, as did the airline that brought me to the United States. And if you guessed Pan Am, congratulations, boomer. In the ensuing years, I worked many jobs to help pay for college, sold cars and cut knives door to door, worked closing shifts at Blockbuster, became a mother and a lawyer at two international law firms. In 2007, I was hired as an attorney at the Federal Reserve. Nobody, was, nobody told me the, the, the financial crisis was upon us. And from there, I went to work for the United States Senate Small Business Committee and the Senate Banking Committee, then became chief legal officer at a large regional bank and finally chairman of the FDIC. It is with this background and tremendous gratitude to the country that gave me the opportunity to attain to the fullest stature of which I'm capable, regardless of the circumstances of my birth or position, which is the very definition of the American dream, that I have approached my current role. I ask every day, what can a regulatory agency do to ensure that our financial system remains resilient, competitive, and the leading destination for financial investments and innovation, while enabling people from all walks of life to achieve their American dream? Please allow me to tell you and buckle up, we're going on a bumpy ride. In March of 2020, the spread of COVID-19 momentously changed American life. This unprecedented shock of widespread lockdowns and fears of viral contagion quickly spread to the, our financial system as markets were gripped by uncertainty. The stock market dropped precipitously. In a period of only four days, the Dow Jones dropped 26%. Treasury yields plunged to record lows oil prices crashed and in April 2020 briefly became negative and market volatility spiked to record levels. 
Now, the FDIC is no stranger to crises. It is an institution born of crises, and successful execution of our mandate depends upon our preparedness and agility in a crisis. In fact, if I were not afraid of committing trade trademark infringement, I might have added our brand is crisis to the official logo last year. The agency prides itself on making bank closures appear effortless. We find comfort in the fact that no depositor has lost a penny of insured deposits since the FDIC was created 88 years ago. Now, for many of us who lived through the 2008 financial crisis, last year was not the first time it felt as if our lives and livelihoods were being turned upside down. But this time was different. The crisis was shocking in its severity and speed. In the second quarter of 2020, real gross domestic product had decreased at an annual rate of 31.7%. And we had to confront the shock to the economy while being at home in lockdowns. We did not know when the economy would reopen, how, which businesses would survive, which would fail, and whether consumers would continue to pay their bills. Early on, navigating the pandemic felt like Sandra Bullock's bird box character, rowing down the river blindfolded. At times, it felt like the only two choices before regulators were speed or crash. By now, you should notice a Sandra Bullock theme here. I know speed too was not even on the table. But thankfully, we did not crash. We took preemptive action and we issued interim final rules and agency statements at an unprecedented pace. Today, there are many reasons to be hopeful for a better outlook for our families and communities. Though we are certainly not letting our guard down, the flexibility and ingenuity demonstrated by the FDIC and our staff, as well as by the banks we supervise, allowed us to meet the challenges of the past year. Beginning in March of last year, the FDIC took quick action to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. We did not know how the pandemic would evolve, but several things were clear. First, Americans needed access to credit to stay in their homes and to keep businesses afloat. Second, regulators wanted banks to work with their customers. Third, banks wanted to work with their customers, but certain regulations made it too complicated to do so. And fourth, banks needed regulatory certainty and transparency as they worked with customers. To address all of the above, regulators acted preemptively to provide necessary flexibility while maintaining the safety and soundness of the banking system. Regulatory nimbleness was especially critical because time was of the essence. We could not wait for the data to show us where we needed to act, and instead, we had to react to a rapidly changing environment. Just as critical, and as the world fell into social distancing measures, we needed to rely upon good old-fashioned human relationships. In those first few weeks of March and April of last year, all of the banking agencies needed to act with remarkable speed on an interagency basis. Now, if you know anything about the interagency process, I claim that it's a tectonic movement. This time, however, it was different. Randy Quarles, the Vice Chairman for Supervision at the Federal Reserve, and Joseph Otting, the former controller of the currency, are not just current or former colleagues. They're my friends. We have shared numerous meals together, met the families, and visited each other's homes. When the time came to pick up the phone and make difficult calls, we had already built a solid foundation based on mutual respect and trust. The long-standing trust that we had built over the years was instrumental to ensuring we were able to take decisive actions on a daily, or in some cases, hourly basis, prioritizing the need of the nation and the financial system over those of particular agencies or institutions. And I may or may not have awaken a fellow regulator in the middle of the night with an urgent phone call. Ultimately, our nation's banks withstood the initial economic and financial market volatility, reflecting their strength, including high asset quality and robust capital and liquidity positions. In sharp contrast to the high number of bank failures during the last financial crisis, we lost only three banks during the pandemic and none due to the pandemic or the ensuing economic stress. Upon weathering the initial shock, banks became instrumental in supporting individuals and businesses through lending and other forms of financial intermediation, 
especially as congressional actions resulted in trillions of dollars being dispersed to individuals and small businesses. And despite some adjustments for our new remote reality, the FDIC's supervisory activities and other essential functions have continued throughout the pandemic. One of the very first actions we took as businesses, schools, public transportation systems, and more began to close was to issue a statement to encourage banks to work with all borrowers, especially borrowers from industry sectors particularly vulnerable to economic volatility, such as airlines, energy companies, and the travel, tourism, and shipping industries, along with small businesses and independent contractors that are reliant on those industries. Learning from 2008, we made clear that prudent modifications to existing loans for affected customers of FDIC supervised banks would not be subject to examiner criticism. We also noted that the FDIC would work with affected financial institutions to reduce burdens when scheduling examinations. Shortly thereafter, and before the CARES Act extended relief, we worked with the Financial Accounting Standards Board to clarify the accounting treatment of short-term loan modifications made on a good faith basis in, respo in response to COVID-19, which was critical to ensuring banks would be able to modify loans to borrowers impacted by the pandemic and lockdowns. Without this relief, banks would have been much more limited in their ability to modify loans as we learned in the last crisis. The CARES Act subsequently expanded the relief beyond short-term loans, and this relief was extended for another year in December. In June, the FDIC and our fellow federal and state banking regulators issued examiner guidance that outlined principles for how our examiners would supervise banks in light of the ongoing impact of the pandemic. We made clear that actions taken in good faith reliance on statements issued by the agencies would not be subject to criticism or other supervisory action down the road, and we still stand by that. To increase the flexibility and capacity of banks to meet customers' needs, we worked closely with the other federal agencies to make targeted regulatory changes to facilitate lending and other financial intermediation including those mandated by the CARES Act. One of the earliest actions we took was encouraging institutions to use their capital and liquidity buffers to support their customers and the economy. We also acted quickly to give institutions the option to delay the effect on regulatory capital of the current expected credit losses or CECL accounting methodology, a new standard that became effective for large publicly traded banks in January of 2020. The FDIC, often with our fellow regulators, also took a series of other actions to allow institutions to extend funds expeditiously to creditworthy households. For example, we temporarily reduced the community bank leverage ratio to 8%, permitted institutions to defer obtaining an appraisal or, or evaluation for up to 120 days provided a 45-day grace period for submitting annual audit reports and to address the dramatic increases in banking assets caused by the fiscal and monetary responses to the pandemic, we allowed community banks to use their end of 2019 asset size for determining applicability of several regulations through the end of 2021. Taken together, these actions increased flexibility for these institutions to comply with regulatory obligations as they worked to meet customer needs. The FDIC also took a number of steps to enable banks to make loans to small businesses under the Small Business Administration's Paycheck Protection Program. Overall, the PPP highlighted the vital role of banks in supporting small businesses through commercial and industrial lending. Banks made the overwhelming majority of PPP loans. And among the banks participating in the PPP, community banks had an outsized impact on their customers and communities. The FDIC facilitated banks' ability to make loans to small businesses under the program by, among other things, issuing rules that allowed banking organizations to neutralize the regulatory capital effects and the liquidity coverage ratio effects of participating in the Federal Reserve's 
PPP lending facility and to mitigate the deposit insurance assessment effect of participating in the PPP. As we responded to the challenges of the pandemic, the 6,000 dedicated employees of the FDIC continue to fulfill the agency's critical mission and our key supervisory activities and other essential functions remained operational. We worked around the clock to prepare to handle a bank failure in a safe manner that minimized our staff's exposure to health risks, but which did not impede the fast and decisive actions that makes the FDIC's receiverships activities so effective. The FDIC first successfully executed on these techniques when on April 3rd, 2020, merely three weeks after the declaration of the national emergency and before we had much understanding of the virus and institution failed for reasons unrelated to COVID-19. Now in the past, the FDIC used to send 50 to 60 people to close a bank. However, in April of 2020, a team of 10 FDIC professionals, affectionately named the Traveling 10, closed the bank in West Virginia. By the time we closed the third bank, the closing team consisted of only four FDIC professionals, affectionately named the Fearless Four. I am hopeful that the producers of Oceans 8, 11, 12, or 13 will take notice and ask for movie rights because surely an FDIC themed movie would be a blockbuster. Throughout this period, the FDIC contacted each of the 50 state banking commissioners, spoke to members of Congress, reached out to consumer groups, and maintained regular contact with supervised institutions. These engagements helped us react in real time to the challenges facing banks and communities across the nation. I applaud our nation's banks and their staff who were on the ground at a time when we did not know whether it was safe to go to the grocery store to buy milk. Large banks and community banks alike were able to continue to provide funding and to keep communities afloat during this difficult time. Another important aspect of regulatory actions throughout the pandemic has been clarity of regulatory expectations. One of my first initiatives as chairman was Trust Through Transparency, which tasked each division and office within the FDIC with being accessible, understandable, responsive, and accountable to the public. To this end, in 2018, we began publishing performance metrics, including turnaround times for examinations and bank charter applications, as well as data on the status of supervisory and assessment appeals. That transparency has been essential throughout the pandemic, as we knew that lack of certainty could prevent financial institutions from doing what was needed to keep people in their homes and to keep credit flowing to American households. To the extent we were providing regulatory flexibility, we had to be transparent in our reasoning for doing so and in our expectations of regulated entities. Part of that effort has been delineating what, are, what is a rule versus what is guidance and the role of each in our regulatory ecosystem. We approved a final rule regarding the role of supervisory guidance, which clarifies the difference between regulations and guidance and underscores that supervisory guidance does not create binding enforceable legal obligations. Guidance can play an important role in providing clarity to supervised institutions, but unlike a law or regulation, guidance is not an appropriate basis on which to take enforcement action. Moreover, the FDIC will not issue supervisory criticisms for violations of supervisory guidance. We also finalized a proposal to establish a new Office of Supervisory Appeals to hear appeals by banks of supervisory determinations made by our examiners. The FDIC's existing appeals process was rarely used. From the beginning of 2007 through the end of 2020, in 13 years, approximately 50 appeals were filed with the Supervisory Appeals Review Committee out of more than 110,000 exams. A robust appeals process is key to promoting consistency among examiners across the country, accountability at the agency, and ultimately stability and public confidence 
in the nation's financial system. To say that the COVID-19 pandemic and the related personal and professional challenges have been unprecedented is to understate the momentous shift that many societies around the world have experienced over the past year. Those challenges have forced us to remember that old idiom, that necessity is the mother of invention. With the deadly virus upon us, we had to adjust everyday activities from how we work to how we procure food to protect ourselves and those around us. That rapid transformation amplified how critical innovation is. Creating a regulatory system that fosters rather than stifles innovation has been a top priority of the FDIC during my tenure and has been underscored by the experience of the past year. Early in my tenure at the FDIC, we established a new Office of Innovation, FDI Tech, to promote innovation at the agency and across the banking sector. Our first chief innovation officer began work earlier this year and has hit the ground running. We're focused on promoting innovation under four broad themes, inclusion, resilience, amplification, and protecting the future. First, we're working towards an inclusive banking system, one that is accessible to all Americans. Second, the American banking system is the strongest, most resilient in the world, and we must take action to ensure that continues to be true throughout the 21st century. Third, we want to use technology to amplify the work of FDIC staff, bank compliance staff, and other stakeholders so that their efforts are not hindered by outdated or inadequate technology. And finally, new banking products and services are emerging on a daily basis, and we want to reframe how we think about the world. We should build a system for 10 years in the future, not a system based on the technology of the last 10 years. Let me provide a few specific examples of how we're moving financial innovation forward, including with respect to alternative data, artificial intelligence, rapid prototyping, and bank partnerships with fintechs. Now, these efforts are meaningful, not because innovation is in vogue, but because of failure to innovate and the imposition of unnecessary regulatory barriers to innovation will inevitably make the United States of America less competitive internationally. And I like to say, I didn't come to the United States for it to be number two. And as I mentioned in a recent podcast, innovation is no longer a question of shall we, shall we not, but how can we do it? Because we must. Throughout my tenure, we have encouraged the use of alternative data by financial institutions. Alternative data is information not typically found in a consumer's credit files at the nationwide consumer reporting agencies, nor customarily provided as part of applications for credit. Using alternative data can improve the speed and accuracy of credit decisions and help firms evaluate the credit worthiness of consumers who might not otherwise have access to credit in the mainstream credit system. The FDIC and our fellow regulators issued guidance in 2019 to encourage the responsible use of alternative data, and this is an area we continue to explore. We have already seen examples of startups using creative underwriting technology that can look beyond traditional criteria. For example, by using bank deposit uh, account cash flow data to offer credit to people who otherwise would not qualify for it. Harnessing the use of technology to improve credit assessments can broaden access to credit and improve, and improve the predictive capacity of such assessments for lenders. In March, alongside our fellow regulators, we issued an interagency request for information on financial institutions' use of artificial intelligence, asking whether additional regulatory clarity would be helpful. Alternative data and AI can be especially important for small businesses, such as sole proprietorships and smaller companies owned by women and minorities, which often do not have a long credit history. These novel measures of credit worthiness, like income streams, can provide critical access to capital, particularly in difficult times. Another example of our work is our rapid prototype, prototyping competition, a type of tech sprint. For this competition, our challenge was to promote more regular reporting from community banks where technology levels vary greatly, 
without increasing, increasing reporting burdens or costs. More than 30 technology firms were invited to participate in this competition. We expect this tech sprint and others that follow to help pave the way for more seamless and timely reporting of more granular data for banks that voluntarily choose to participate. We have also been working on several initiatives to facilitate partnerships between fintechs and banks that can allow banks to reach new customers and offer new products. At the end of 2020, we updated our broker deposits regulations, the first substantial update in approximately 30 years, and removed regulatory hurdles to certain types of innovative partnerships between banks and fintechs. In 1989, Congress passed a law imposing restrictions on deposits accepted by or through a deposit broker. As the banking sector changed, the broker deposits regime struggled to keep pace. Over the years, the FDIC faced constant questions regarding whether specific deposit arrangements were brokered or not. The agency typically responded on a one-off basis or not at all, resulting in a fragmented opaque legal regime. Our new framework creates a clearer, more transparent framework for evaluating whether deposits are brokered. Importantly, our modernized framework excludes many innovative types of fintech partnerships from the broker deposit definition, while still capturing the types of deposit brokers the law was intended to cover. In addition to our broker deposits rule, Last year, we asked stakeholders to comment on a groundbreaking approach to facilitate technology partnerships. Our request for information proposed a public-private standard setting organization, or SSO, to establish standards for due diligence of vendors and for the technologies they develop. This voluntary certification program would help reduce the cost and uncertainty associated with the introduction of new technology at financial institutions. We received many supportive comments in response to the RFI and continue to pursue the concept actively. We will continue to look at what policy changes are needed to encourage innovation while maintaining a safe and secure financial system. Rather than playing catch up with technological advances, the FDIC's goal is to stay on the forefront of changes through increased collaboration and partnership with the financial sector. Although we must remain vigilant about continued uncertainty resulting from the pandemic, we must also keep our eye on the country's long-term competitiveness and the regulatory action needed to maintain it. This presents somewhat of a conundrum for a regulatory agency like the FDIC, which is supposed to be risk averse. But being too risk averse leads to decreased credit availability and increased cost of capital for American households and businesses. Moreover, if we're so risk averse that we stifle the ability of our financial system to evolve with the technological advances, the United States may cease to be a place where ideas become concepts and those concepts become the products and services that improve people's lives. Our banks have to innovate to survive. And through agencies, and those agencies historically have tended to be risk averse, we must learn how to manage the risk coming from innovation and new technologies, because if we do not all allow entrepreneurship to flourish in the United States, it will flourish elsewhere. This is not a far-fetched statement. I know firsthand. On the technology front, to give one example, China recently introduced digital currency. Far from merely a domestic endeavor, the digital yen has the potential to expand internationally. One recent estimate is that this currency could eventually reach 1 billion users, all while, while bypassing US dollar related system and ultimately the US sanctions regime as well. This, this should give us a lot to think about. In light of the rapid pace of technological change worldwide, including by countries who are not saddled with legacy systems that can slow the adoption of new technologies the challenge for regulators is to create an environment in which fintechs and banks can collaborate and in which banks are given the space and opportunity to pursue innovative solutions for their customers. One topic that some banks have begun to look at is digital assets. 
at the FDIC, we have been watching such developments closely and we plan to issue a request for information to learn more about what banks are doing, what banks are considering doing, and what, if anything, the FDIC should be doing in this space. It has been my goal as chairman that the FDIC laid the foundation for the next chapter of banking by encouraging innovation that meets consumer demand, promotes community banking, reduces compliance burdens, and modernizes our supervision while increasing the number of banked Americans. Although the FDIC has limited ability to address the direct cost of developing and deploying technology at any one institution, there are things that we can do to foster innovation across all banks and to reduce the regulatory cost of that innovation. We have to get on the ground, roll up our sleeves, and get to work on supporting and advancing a regulatory framework that supports innovation accessible to all banks, especially community banks that face challenges from consolidation and economies of scale, and that is responsive to ever-changing technological demands. Now, I'll conclude with this. I was raised in a command economy that offered no opportunity for someone like me to achieve everything of which I was capable. I realized how rare, perhaps unthinkable, it would be in many countries for a foreign born girl with a hard to pronounce name, no money and no connections to someday become chairman of an important federal agency. But 30 years ago, this foreign born girl made the journey to the best and perhaps only country in the world where that would be possible. I assumed the chairmanship of the FDIC with a firm belief that our founding fathers created a system of government that however imperfect is far superior to that of most other countries. That of the many things that make America unique, the diversity of our backgrounds, struggles and aspirations somehow collectively translate into an American dream that binds us. That the role of government in our society is to promote, not to inhibit growth, freedom and opportunity. There is still much work to do to address the problems and hardships many Americans face. Some of these challenges were exacerbated by the pandemic, and it is important that we address these difficulties as we work to recover from one of the most unprecedented shocks to our economy in modern times. But the American dream is still alive and well. I believe that it exists and it should exist for all Americans. And I will continue to work for a financial regulatory framework that nurtures those dreams by fostering innovation, promoting competition and consumer choice and support, supporting the rule of law. I will continue to work on the United States of America remaining number one in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Chair McWilliams for those thoughtful remarks. Um, why don't I start off the, the Q&A session here, um, but I'll uh, just note to um, our, our viewers that if they have a question to either uh, submit a question online or they can raise their hands and I'll call on them. So why don't I just pick up on, on your remarks about the importance of financial inclusion and uh, ask that what's the role of de novo institutions potentially in improving financial inclusion? You know, but prior to your chairmanship, there was a real dearth of new banks and de, 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 uh, de novo charters. What role do you think uh, in, increasing the number of de, uh, de novo charters can have in improving financial inclusion? I think uh, de novo banks in particular can play a, a huge role in financial inclusion. And when we talk about financial inclusion, you know, I talked about, you know, my concept of, of the American dream and, and my life story here and how uh, coming to America basically provided the opportunity for me. But really, that opportunity didn't come to me until I became a part of the financial system because I had no other access to capital. Remember, five hundred dollars is not a lot to survive on in the United States. So when we look at these new entrants into the marketplace, first, Competition is good. It's good for the co consumers. It's good for the other for the existing players in the system. It makes them, um, I would say, hustle a little bit more, be a little bit better, uh, and it basically drives the cost of, of products and services to customers while providing more availability um, and and greater diversity of products and services. And so, when we look at the de novo process, it was really important to me to kind of a. Uh, um, create a path and and again you, you'll see a theme in, in my in my throughout my chairmanship at the FDIC 
financial institutions need a path. They need a roadmap. If you tell them the rules of the road, which have to be clear, they have to be certain, and they can't be ever changing, they will they will basically abide by those rules and they will follow that path to success for their, for themselves and their communities. And so when we look at the de novo process, we basically shortened the application time and we're now holding ourselves accountable as an agency to process these applications once they are filed within 120 days. Um, and and so, th so if the founder of the bank you know, needs to know and, and they have capital locked up in order for them to start this bank, they don't have to keep that capital locked up for too long. But I do think there's an opportunity to think outside the box and to utilize innovation to consider how we can even more um, offer up a, a diverse landscape among our banks uh, in this new ever evolving technological world. Good. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, your your efforts to improve the transparency and certainty of the FDIC rules. And you, you mentioned in your remarks on how you've put out a guidance you know, indicating that guidance will just be that guidance and it won't be binding and that uh, uh, for what will really be the rules of the road will be rules that are approved through the Administrative Procedures Act and that have been approved by the FDIC board. Now, I think to the audience here is pretty familiar with kind of the due process uh, issues involved and why you why you did that. Um, um, but I'd like to know a little bit more about how those efforts to provide better legal certainty um, and rule of law uh, for banking regulation have actually improved the quality of, of, of bank regulation. I would say they have had um, um, quite a, quite an impact on on bank regulation, and I'll tell you why. Personally, now there may be some, but personally, I never met a banker who said I willfully want to violate the law. And and so um, most of the of the people in business, including banks, want to abide by the rules. They need to know what the rules are, and there is a process to go through, which you know is another thing that I'm grateful for in the United States of America where these rules get the, the light of the day before they become rules. So we have a process that consists of either advanced notice of proposed rulemaking to which public has an opportunity to comment or and or proposed rulemaking. Uh, and then we, you know, again, we give an opportunity to public to comment and then we finalize that rule. And so I would say there are many checks and balances in that process, including that the, the agency like the FDIC has to respond to the comments received uh, in, in, the, in the public's comment process. And so when we, we get to the point of having a rule out there, it's been vetted and vetted again and vetted again. And, and hopefully the outside parties, uh, the stakeholders, the public, the, the, the legal minds, the businesses, et cetera, had an opportunity to kind of a, um, what I call, like to say, shoot holes in our arguments as we put them out there. And that allows for a better work product in the end in terms of the regulatory framework we put out. Because in the end, the point of the regulatory framework is not to be so opaque and, and you know, um, uh, covered by the cloak of, of, uh, of, of vagueness uh, and, and opacity that, that you don't know what to do. You know, businesses need a roadmap, and I talked about this in my speech, and they will follow that roadmap. So I do think that um, clarifying that guidance is guidance and it's not legally binding and regulation is legally binding and you have to um, uh, comply with it. Uh, and then holding ourselves as an agency accountable is crucial to having a rule of law in a country that depends on it for its success. Uh, and really what I would say distinguishes the United States from many other regimes is that the rule of law is something that uh, if we abandon it, we kind of lose the, the very structure that this system was built upon. Um, and, and that's something that to me as somebody who had to earn the privilege of being uh, an American is, is essentially important. Uh, well said. Um, let's let's move back to um, your your work last year on on combating uh, the financial crisis. Um, you know, you've talked a little bit about how you uh, had to coordinate with the other banking regulators, and that's one of the unique aspects of of the U.S. system is the number of regulators. Um, but what you also have another piece of that, which you did talk about, which I want to hear more about, which is. Um, the the 50 plus state regulators as well you know you are also at the have to manage the federal regulators but then you have to interact with the state uh, regulators who have ju uh, concurrent jurisdiction over the uh, banks you regulate can you talk a little bit about how you coordinated all these um, different parties um, because that's a lot of people to lead particularly in the midst of a crisis it's, uh, I would say it's challenging at times. Um, but when I first came to the FDIC, uh, it was important to me that state regulators with whom we have shared and joint uh, supervisory uh, and examination responsibilities understand that 
uh, we, we appreciate them. The, the federal partner that is the FDIC to them uh, respects their jurisdiction and respects what they do on the ground and respects the, the role of state super supervisors in our federal system. And so I committed, um, I was appalled, frankly, when I realized that there were some states uh, in the union where no FDIC chairman has ever stepped foot in official capacity. Oh. And so I, I was uh, I was taken aback, aback by, by that and I committed to doing a 50-state um, tour in person to basically hear from those supervisors on the ground, to talk to their examination staff within the state agencies, as well as to meet with our regulated entities uh, on their home turf. And so before the pandemic, uh, within a year and a half, uh, I was able to cover about 30 of those uh, state visits and uh, we have continued remotely during the pandemic and we hope to continue in person after the pandemic. But uh, that's one of the goals I, I intend to fulfill before I leave uh, my term at the end of it. Having said that, I think especially last year, it was crucial to recognize the role that state regulators play. And obviously, um, you know, you mentioned the number of regulators at the federal level. If you were setting up a, a, a regulatory framework anew, you probably wouldn't do what we have uh, currently. But, you know, historically, agencies evolved. They came to existence and we all have different uh, mandates, slightly different mandates and some shared responsibilities. But really, the role of the state supervisors has been there from from you know day one, as as before we even had federal regulation, banks were regulated at the state level. So it's important to recognize the depth of knowledge, the expertise, and really the the hands on the ground, the feet on the ground that you have in those states, uh, especially at a time when there were fast moving changes with the pandemic and business closures. So picking up a phone and say, calling a commissioner in Tennessee and saying, what are you seeing in the ground? How are your banks faring? Are your people, are your customers, you know, their customers supposed to, are, are they able to obtain credit? Are they, are they able to stay in their homes? You know, and getting that information real time is something that frankly, um, nothing can replace. You can't rely on quarterly call report data to tell you, you know, what happened four months ago for you to fix it now when four months ago was a long time ago. And so it was crucial to recognize the role that states play and to recognize the, the hard work, frankly, of uh, and, and frankly, not always very appreciated uh, work of, of the examiners on the ground in those states and the state supervisors. So that's why it was personally important for me that we reach out to every state on a one-to-one one, one -one basis um, in, in, a, in a coordinated fashion, and then also to make those calls as we saw the need and changes in different states in economic conditions. So, so l let me talk about then the other big party here you have, have to work, work with uh, in your job, and particularly in responding to the crisis, which is, which is Congress. And uh, we saw Congress take uh, unprecedented action over the last year to, to help uh, address uh, the economic, economic downturn, starting off with the, the CARES Act, uh, establishment of PPP and other programs. How, how critical was Congress's involvement in responding to the crisis in helping us get to a, a, a much better outcome? Uh, you know, we saw a sharp decline in markets, sharp decline in GDP and, and employment. But then we've seen actually uh, starting in the second half of last year, a much sharper bounce back than I think anybody would have expected last, last March. Um, how, how essential was Congress to come in? Uh, or do you think banking regulators you know, would, have, would have had the tools to handle that crisis kind of by themselves? Yeah. So I will say that I will let uh, the, 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 the issue of, um, of the success uh, uh, of congressional actions, you know, to history and, and, and bigger minds than me will debate that over time. Certainly the, the influx of, of cash uh, to the economy um, um, allowed people to stay in their homes. Um, but even before that took place, I think it's really important to recognize what the private sector did here and what the regulators frankly did here. You know, I call it the regulatory whack-a-mole. Uh, we try to preemptively see where the problems may be and to preemptively address them. And frankly, uh, the decision-making that took place in March and April of last year was uh, so speedy, so expeditious based on, you know, I, I mentioned Sandra Bullock's character in uh, Bird Box, you know, literally blindfolded, we had to fly through so many things. Um, and, and banks throughout all of this stayed open. They, they stayed on the ground. You know, we, we had banks that actually had staff on the ground throughout the entire pandemic. And when everybody, you know, walked into a grocery store looking like a ninja, uh, all covered up and, and uh, uh, not knowing if, if it's safe to go buy milk and bread, these banks stayed open. And so it's important to understand that, uh, you know, early on in the pandemic, I started making calls. This was 
I would say middle of March of last year, of last year, I started making calls to the CEOs of our larger banks. And I said, hey, what's going on? What are you seeing on the ground? Um, we want people to stay in their homes. We want people to have access to credit. What are you doing to, to um, accommodate that? And one of the things that inevitably almost every CEO said, we want to modify these loans. We want to work with our borrowers. We have preemptively and proactively made these calls, but we have a little problem that's called uh, trouble debt restructuring classification under uh, GAAP standards. And all US banks have to follow GAAP. Uh, that's a statutory mandate. And so they told me we have loans that we um, uh, modified in 2008. that are still performing to this day 13 years later, but they were classified as trouble debt restructuring and as such, sit as such a classification, which is a negative classification on the bank's books for you know more than a decade. So we worked very proactively with uh, FASB, as I mentioned, to make sure that uh, banks can modify loans. So I do think that it's really important to recognize that, that uh, long before the CARES Act became the law of the land, uh, there was swift regulatory action. Um, I would say probably unprecedented coordination on behalf of the regulatory agencies, as well as a colossal push by the private sector and banks in particular to make sure that they are working with people affected by the business shutdowns and the loss of jobs. Well, it was an, indeed a remarkable response by the federal banking agencies and particularly the preemptive nature of it uh, was pretty unprecedented. So um, I, I agree with you, historians are gonna be examining the last year uh, for, for dec decades to come. Yeah. Well, I wanna uh, thank you for uh, being with us today and your wonderful remarks and taking time to answer a few questions for, for, for the audience. And thank you for your service to this country. Um, thank you very much, Chair, Chair McWilliams. Thank you um, very much. We're now going to uh, move, uh, have our first break and move to the lounge um, to, um, to follow up on what Dean said at the beginning uh, of the hour. It, to join the lounge, the digital team will send you an alert, which will appear at the top right corner of your screen. Click on that alert to move to the lounge, and then cl click on, uh, on one of the boxes that appears to join uh, a table. You can also join the lounge by clicking the uh, clicking lounge on the top of your screen. You'll just need to turn your camera and mic back on when you sit down at the table. We'll hope you uh, uh, will uh, hope you'll join us. Uh, our next panel will begin in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.